Hello, my name is Yan Bin Jia. I'm at Iowa State University. Today I'm going to talk about grasping and de cutting of deformable objects. So, why deformable objects? Because they are um, everywhere in our daily life, from what we wear to what we eat to what we um, work and play with and to who we are as creatures. Um, skills of manipulating these objects are a good measure of the robot's intelligence and dexterity. And the, the topic is also um, very under-researched. Okay. Um, there, are, there are two reasons. One reason is from mechanics. Um, um, we haven't uh, fully understood the mechanics behind such manipulation. The other one is lies on the computation because it often draws upon finite animal methods for the modeling, which is very expensive. So in the first part, I'm going to talk about um, deformable grasping using the simple strategy of squeezing, why it works, um, and then how to pick up objects by just simply squeezing them and, and doing this um, virtual liftability test. The second part, I'm going to move on to um, control the knife to cut objects, especially, you know, fruits, um, vegetables, and meats, um, very skillfully. Okay. So first um, part is going to be the modeling, and second part um, is going to be um, the control. So deformable grasping the work was done with my former students, Feng Guo, Huan Ning, and Fei Fei Wan. Why deformable grasping? Why it's difficult? First of all, we know that there are two kinds of measures of rigid body grasping. One is form closure, um, which says that all the degrees of freedom of the object has been prohibited. The other one is force closure, which measures the grasp ability to, resi to resist any force and torque exerted externally. But these two concepts are no longer um, applicable to a deformable grasping. For form closure, because a deformable object has infinite degrees of freedom, you cannot prohibit, prohibit all of them. Um, when it comes to force closure and a deformable object, its geometry changes during the process of grasping. Okay? And then the contacts um, can shrink and grow, but often grows. So the contact points it are no longer points, they are actually regions. And added to that is the very high computational cost of modeling, which I mentioned a little earlier, because often it comes down to the use of finite animal methods. Um, and another complication is that when you use the FEM, you need constraints. But these contact constraints and the end of the grasp, when it's achieved, cannot be predicted um, very easily or straightforwardly in the very beginning of the grasp because you don't know what you know the final shape of the object is going to be unless you really progress to compute it okay there has been very uh, little work um, done in robotics on the deformable grasping earlier work focused on um, linear deformable objects which require you know it's manipulation and planning which requires um, no extensive, no expensive modeling. In the recent work, um, uh, especially from Berenson's uh, group, um, they are trying to use um, avoid FEM modeling. Instead, they are using global task planning, um, couple that with local control to do the manipulation of deformable objects. Okay, so rigid body grasping, the parent, you know, Basically, we specify forces to achieve, you know, and then to see that check, you know, this is going to be uh, equilibrium grasp okay, or a grasp that can resist, you know, an adversary range. But for deformable objects, um, because its geometry is changing, you can no longer guarantee equilibrium by specifying forces, okay, and the forces will have to change. So for deformable grasping, there's a paradigm change. Now we moved from um, forces to displacements. This has a few benefits. First of all, um, 
The information is computable from these displacement constraints imposed by the fingers grasping the object. Uh, secondly, um, force and moment equilibrium are automatically guaranteed. Okay. Um, so the third one, it's easier. The third reason that it's easier to control the displacements because you can never, you never know the forces. You cannot control it. You know, because the forces is due to deformation. Okay, so the first topic we look at is a very simple strategy, which is a squeeze grasp. You just have, for instance, two fingers making point contact with the object and squeeze them, right? So the finite element methods gives us constitutive equation here. Uh, this delta represents, you know, all the nodal displacements, which essentially corresponds to the deformed shape. And then F represents the forces exerted by the fingers. We can transform the equation. Um, such that on the right hand side we have only the displacements of contact nodes these are essentially the quantities to be controlled so they are known um, and we can compute the forces and the finger contacts from that um, the constitutive equation essentially gets reduced to um, you know this form and this is a reduced constitutive equation and it also allows us to compute um, the displacement at all the nodes these nodes don't have forces exerted on them if they're not in contact with the fingers, but they do have um, displacements. And these displacements, you know, these nodal displacements will completely determine the deformed shape. So there are two types of a grasp from this. Okay? One of them is a stable squeeze, uh, which minimizes the potential energy of the system. Okay? The potential energy is the strain energy of the body. Um, plus the load potential. All right. So as you illustrated in the first finger here, the first figure here, uh, these stable squeezes are actually have the force directions opposing each other. The other type of a squeeze um, will generate finger movements that result in no rotation or translation of the object. Okay. So it's more uh, efficient in the sense. The pure squeeze directions are given by these two screen, green arrows. As you compare the second and third figure, and you see that a pure squeeze exerted about half uh, the magnitude of the force as stable squeeze. It seems more natural when you grasp an object, you try to bend it, a deformable object. So that strategy is based on point contact, but we can easily generate it to a regional contact um, and then as long as we classify four events, there is the contact establishment and contact breaking. Um, and then there's also two different contact modes, you know, um, that they're either a, the contact of the node is sliding or the contact is sticking. And then there's transitions between these nodes. So we can do this incrementally to track the contact regions. All right, so another thing uh, we can use um, is we can look into is how to resist an adversary finger. So the optimal resistance used to be a very hot topic uh, in rigid body grasping, where the quality of a rigid body grasp is often characterized by you know the amount of force and range to resist a unit adversary force and range exerted by uh, external fingers. Um, but again, that concept no longer applies now here because the object is deforming and then the torque is changing and the force is changing as well. So we introduced the notion of a metric that uses work um, to resist unit translation by adversary finger. Here is a simple example. So this is the object and initially it's grasped by two fingers, F1 and F2. Um, this is a grasp is achieved by a squeeze okay um, from f2 under this translation once the grasp is achieved by f1 and f2 now we add a third finger which is the adversary finger a and it's determined to move in that direction even by this red arrow to break the grasp okay to resist that grasp the optimal trajectory computed by our program our algorithm says that f1 should move along this curve so basically f1 back up a little bit while f2 um, pushes forward to resist 
um, this graph, this um, adversary finger, this results in the minimum work done by the F1 and F2 um, to resist the unit translation by the adversary finger. So now we can use that strategy to pick up a soft object that's resting on the plane. The idea is very simple. You know, just close your eyes and see how you would pick up an object. You would basically put your fingers on the object and squeeze it, um, and then squeeze a little bit harder and try to move it up. And then once you feel there's some slip happening at the fingertips, you squeeze even more, right? Until you feel that it's secure now, you can lift it up. So you keep doing this kind of a testing. Um, um, so we call this liftability test. What happens is that you know we do the squeeze by using the modeling program to hypothetically remove the supporting plane and then compute these forces on the fingertips and also the contact modes. Um, if both fingers and all the uh, um, nodal contacts on the finger are sliding and then the finger is sliding, as long as one of them is sticking and the finger is not losing contact. If, if one of the fingers has contact sliding, and then that virtual test is fails. So once we pass the virtual test as you squeeze a little bit further, and if the liftable weight now reaches the real weight of the object, then it's time to lift it up. So here's one example um, is this um, tomato and we construct a mesh. Um, and this is the curve, this plot shows the ratio between the liftable weight and the real weight. When it reaches one, means that it's, it's time to lift it up. And this is actually monotonic, where the horizontal axis shows you the squeeze steps. The more you squeeze, the higher, the larger the liftable weight. Once it reaches the real weight, then just lift it. Um, so as you picture this process, though, when the two fingertips here put on the, um, the tomato, um, and then to keep squeezing simultaneously, the modeling program in the right corner here is computing all the contact modes and then the liftable weight um, and then tracking it until that ratio becomes one. And it turns out this strategy is conservative as we never failed in our experiments. Now we move on to dexterous cutting. This is the work done with the current students, Prajwa Jam Dagni, uh, Xiao Qian Mu, and Yue Chuan Xue. Okay. So why robotic cutting? Well, it's because we really wanted to look into uh, automation of kitchen skills. This is the integral part of the home automation. So far, uh, robots have been used in those peripheral tasks such as washing and sorting disks and cleaning floors in the kitchen. But what we really want is to have a robot master these sophisticated you know, cutting skills um, this could relieve people from the daily chores and, you know, reduce the cost uh, of health care, especially for the elderly and the people with disabilities. Um, and these moves are sophisticated enough, so they do have very high research merit. Um, and currently, you know, in the food sector, which has five times the size of automobile uh, auto industry, um, there's much less application of robots. The machine that the tools are very specially designed. Uh, just imagine that you know you've come back to the context of a robotic kitchen. If you're gonna you know house all the specialized machines, each capable of one task, and to automate this meal preparation, and then you would have to have a very large place to store all these uh, the machines. And not to mention that this uh, transfer of the food you know from one machine to another, right? So that's going to be very cumbersome. All right. And then there's also advantages of using robots in food processing, reducing the risk and improving um, food hygiene and so on. Uh, related work come from fracture mechanics, um, cutting biological tissues, needle insertion, for instance, um, and also it relies on uh, control strategies which are going to be used to implement these skills. So we have you know, different uh, position control, force control, impedance control, hybrid control. Right. Recently, there has been a surge in the interest of food cutting that especially is data driven. Um, look at all the cutting scenarios, you know, instances to train the robot, for instance. Um, all right. So, what's the purpose of modeling? And you ask, though, because 
as the blade cutting into the object, okay, the work done by the blade um, creates fracture as this equation shows, and it also changes the shape of the object. So it's gonna pump uh, strain energy into the object, okay? Um, or, and also it may um, create a velocity of the object, you know, generating some kinetic energy, and it also has to overcome the friction between the blade and the material. So what we wanted to do through modeling is just basically um, to determine the forces of these different kinds so we can use, identify one force, for instance, the contact force between the object and the board or between the knife and the board. So for us to plan uh, the trajectory of the knife and to control the knife to ensure that the object is completely separated. Okay. Um, all right. So now to model this because deformation is involved, so we have to resort to FEM. Unfortunately, to model this object's deformation and fracture using a full 3D mesh is very expensive and you would have to have very, very small tetrahedral elements, for instance, near the blade edge. But that is impossible, you know, very, very expensive. And that cannot be used in real time. So we came up with a strategy that just basically generate a sequence of parallel slices of the object and turn the 3D modeling problem into 2D, which allows us to um, apply, you know, generate, use very, very small triangular uh, elements to model, you know, the fracture part that's right underneath the edge of the knife. Okay, so the work now becomes work density in the 2D plane. Um, and then there is also, you know, the string energy and a work to overcome friction now has a tilde, each has a tilde, which represents the density. So as a knife moves down, as shown in this, in this picture, uh, for a distance of dy, the actual fracture along the direction ds um, is often less than dy because the object deforms a little bit, right? Um, so we introduce this notion of energy release rate. We first ignore the work to overcome friction, look at the difference between the work done by the knife and then the strain energy and look at the difference and then divide it by ds, that's gonna give us the energy release rate. But you know, as, as the knife cuts in, it's not uh, necessarily generates fracture. Um, so we say that a crack happens when this energy release rate reaches uh, the fracture toughness that measures um, the amount of work to generate unit area fracture. So once we determine fracture happens, now we go back um, and consider the work that needs to that is needed to overcome friction to determine the exact crack depths. Okay. So now after we deal with individual slices, we use the interpolation. Um, to um, recover um, the fracture of the entire object as well as the deformation. So as we often realize from our, our own cutting ex uh, experience that if you push the knife straight forward down, it turns out to be very hard uh, to fracture an object to cut you know, a vegetable or, or a meat or fruit open. But if you slice to have the knife move sideways to have some tangential velocity, that the task tends to be easier. So we worked out um, the fracture toughness as a function of the slice push ratio as well as the Poisson's ratio. So slice push ratio is a tangent of this angle. Okay, the deviation of the slicing direction, the translation of the knife from the vertical direction. Okay. Um, so that ratio is the ratio between the actual fracture toughness um, to the maximum fracture toughness. So the experiments um, are done with a number of objects to validate this. So here is first cutting experiments of, of done on the potatoes. Okay. As you see that uh, this uh, slicing uh, angle keeps increasing. So it, there's more and more tangential opponent, right? When you check the, uh, the, the force exerted by the knife though, in the vertical direction, that is the dominant component. Okay, when compared with the horizontal component, the forces actually decrease. Okay. So the higher the slice push ratio, uh, the decrease in the um, in the force. And then here, uh, the red plot shows the modeled value, the modeled force change trajectory. Um, and the dotted one refers to 
the trajectory as measured by the sensor, the force torque sensor. They are actually pretty close. The effect is even more, the reduction effect is even more dramatic um, in the cutting of the eggplant. As you see that, uh, the higher slicing ratio, okay, um, slice push ratio, reduces the force from 150 newtons to 40 newtons than the peak. Okay. So it does help. And then the last uh, problem I'd like to touch is the uh, cutting strategy, which is three-phase cutting strategy that involves pressing, going downward, and then touching, you know, with the quick movement um, at the touch, we wanted to soften the impact, soften the impact between the object and uh, between the knife and the cutting board. And then finally, we use a slicing strategy to make sure that the contact point, the knife board contact point moves from left to the right, so the object is completely separated. So three types of control, three phases require three different controls. The first pressing phase, when the knife, before it touches the cutting board, we use position control. In the touching, we use impedance control, which is very effective in terms of um, decreasing that contact force, impulsive contact force. And for slicing, we make sure that tangentially it's position control and vertically it's force control to ensure that knife and then the board is in contact. Okay. So um, you can have the translation, the slicing phase, the pure translation or the pure rolling, which is called the rock chop, or you can mix translation and rotation. So now here's a video um, of cutting various objects. And as you see that in the slicing phase, the object is actually the knife is changing its orientation as well in a very smooth way. So touching generates that sound, and then that impulsive force is softened by impedance control. Because our robotic arm has only two degrees of freedom in the plane, we put this, we make use of a linear guide, which adds a third degree um, that's needed for generating this um, rock chop. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors, especially this research is in down um, under two National Science Foundation grants. Thank you.